September 11, 2007, a catastrophic day for North Carolina's most famous outdoor drama. All the costumes for the lost colony reduced to ashes. I got a phone call from the producer at that point and uh, saying, Every piece of clothing, every piece of history, every reference book, every book, every armor, Andy Griffith's sword, all burned up, all gone. All the history of design, the history of design through all those decades was gone in a flash. And then AP called. Their question was, well, what's the most valuable thing you lost? And, and I said, oh, Andy Griffith's sword. He wore it to Walter Raleigh. We kept it and we used it on special nights and you know, it was irreplaceable because it's in all the photographs. He's kneeling, holding it and everything. And uh, the next morning in the morning, Billy, this is Andy. I've got the sword. William Ivy Long knows every prop and stitch of clothing in the Lost Colony. He grew up there, in fact, but it wasn't his first theater experience. Well, once upon a time, when I was, I guess, six weeks old, I was brought back from the hospital experience in Raleigh to the outdoor amphitheater of the Raleigh Little Theater stage left dressing room. It is still there to this day. And that became my first home, first home with walls and a ceiling. And I lived there with my parents for three years, my first three years until my brother was expected and then they thought maybe we should have a proper home. But it was my first proper home. And you can remember back to three. I remember you, w you would open the door outside of that, to, you know, to go outside. And the first step you took was onto the stage. Then to the left would be the auditorium and all the seats. And to the right, much more important for me, was the rose garden because there was a fountain with a cherub holding a dolphin and all these roses, but mostly there was the fountain and the water, and I just wanted to go swimming all the time. And to grow up literally on a stage has set the tone for my entire life. My parents, I'm named after my father, who was William Ivy Long, and my mother, Mary Wood Long. They both were from farm families. Actually, my father from farm family, my mother from lumber family. They met at Chapel Hill. They both were Carolina Playmakers, which was one of the sponsors uh, of the Lost Colony. The Carolina Playmakers were uh, focused and, and concerned about folk drama. And of course, the Lost Colony is sort of the ultimate folk drama. It's the beginning of who we are, the first colony uh, established in North America by English people. My brother and I and my sister uh, have all been in the Lost Colony. We had to wait until we were eight years old and then they deemed us old enough to be allowed to run around in the dark, barefooted, backstage with strange theater people. And then by 12, I was prop master. I was precocious. I'm a natural list maker. I'm a Virgo, born in August, so of course I'm organized and make lists. So of course, you know, prop master was the natural next step. But by 18, I was tech director myself. Then I went off to school at Yale Drama School, which is all about the plays, the play's the thing. I was a set designer. That's what I wanted to do. I, I was going to be the stage designer of all time. And I've taken only one course in costume design in my entire life. Isn't that crazy? Like all aspiring theater people, William felt the pull of New York City. I was at the beginning. I moved to the, che the famous Chelsea Hotel because I was... Uh, Des desperate to be land in the middle of it, in the thick of New York. Well, boy, did I. <laughs> the famous, infamous Chelsea Hotel. I lived there for my first five years. On the front, next to the Chelsea Hotel sign. Uh, and I was in room 411. What is 411? That's information. So I would get calls on the house phone from the most interesting voices that sound oddly familiar. And I would then look, I had a phone book, and I would look up the number and tell it to them. So I have never, I've almost never, never, never gotten a job from an interview. I've only gotten a job from the person who sat to the left of me at, in school or to the right of me and with whom I did a lot of productions and saved the day with, oh, here's the perfect fill in the blank, shirt, shoe, blouse, Penier, um, oh, I understand how to solve that character dilemma. Let me think of, figure it out. So that's the only way I've ever 
gotten any, any jobs. So I never got, uh, for three years, no one would hire me. Finally, I get a call. My, a friend of mine had a job as a set designer for Inspector General at the Circle in the Square. And the late great, he just passed away, Liviu Chule, Romanian director, was directing him. And he said, oh, get me someone to do the costumes. So she said, my friend, I've got a friend. He said, fine, let's just start work. So I didn't even interview. I just came in with my portfolio, so proud. Oh, look, I, maybe you get this job. And he just give, started giving me notes. So that's how I got my first Broadway show, just like that. Oh, I've got a friend. Yes, of course he's fashionable, but that's not why you hire William to create your costumes. You hire him because he understands he's designing for character, for theme, for plot, and of course uh, he's sexy and fashionable. But it's the other stuff that comes first. How do you tell the story? And William is extremely helpful uh, in, in carrying his weight in telling the story that the author intended. I, for, I start by reading the play and researching the period. And you see, and oh, it's, it's high, high style. It's high style. It's rich people in Paris who go out the weekend to misbehave. And of course, it all, all hell breaks loose. And so this is 1959 uh, Balenciaga. These are because they do dress for dinner. It's called Don't Dress for Dinner, but they do dress for dinner now. Ha, ha, ha. Anyway, uh, look at these reference pictures. I always do this beforehand and surround myself with walls and walls of these research pictures. But John, the set designer came, and you see his original set was very beige, but after looking at how well these colors work with everything, um, he brought in more of this burnt umber, this very light burnt umber, just to say. And I peopled them after the set designers created the world. Who are you? Me? Yes, you. It's her. Who? You know who? I have the faintest idea. Who? You don't know who? Why do you think I was going bananas back here, trying to keep warm? I didn't know what you were doing. You mean, it isn't her? Who? Of course it isn't her. Who? Well, if it isn't her, who is it? Who? That's what I'm trying to find out. <laughs> who are you? I'm his girlfriend. <laughs> and I do my first sketches after the research like this. These are called thumbnails. Here are the men going, here's the husband, the lover, and the husband of the cook. And I show them in order, and then I color them in. And you can actually, when you see these bigger pictures, you can see that I've really sort of solved most of the proportion and color problems right here. And here are the ladies, and the same thing. Here's the mistress, the wife, and the cook. So then I do her big ball gown, you see blue. I have this theory that ladies of the house either dress to stand out from their environs, environments or to blend into it. Um, she stands out from it, because the blue stands out from all this beige. The best friend, and lover of the wife, I match them up. You do things like this. I call it Kiss Me Kate designing. See, they are, they are matched because they are the ones having an affair at the beginning. This is not in the script. This is what I proffered to the production. Well, the day begins with the staff coming at nine. So I prepared all the projects and their notes, really annoying notes on everyone's desk. And then we're off and running and the phones start ringing and all the projects call, I need this, I need that. So there's a lot of technical support work that's done first off around the globe, whatever country Chicago is touring or something else, our producers, Hairspray, they're still touring all around. And then the, the actual that day uh, begins. And sometimes people come for fittings, sometimes I go to fittings. Then if it's rehearsing in the afternoon, the latest show, I go and have a wig fitting or they want to show me a new dance number and why the shoes are not working. And I do that. And then the evening performance. I'm supposed to be at least two, at two shows in previews tonight. <laughs> so I will go back and forth. And then I go for notes afterwards. So I'm done by about 1 o'clock, 1 a.m. And then I get up at 5. Now that's not all the time. That's, that's, that's on a good day. I'm happy to be working. Seaboard, North Carolina, up in Northampton County, is about as different from New York as you can get. But it's William's family home, and it tugs at him. As the town's fortunes have declined, William has stepped in, putting in a health clinic, buying the old school where his father learned playwriting. We took out all the 
really rotted stuff so we could get at the um, asbestos. Now it looks just insane. I love the way it looks. I actually love the way this looks. Very Tennessee Williams. And partnering with North Carolina State University on a school of fashion and costume. And I've spent the last about 12 years uh, trying to help the town become whole again. A home in New York and a home in Seaboard should be enough for one person, right? Especially someone as busy as William Ivy Long. Then I just thought, okay, now I'm sailing. I've, I've broken through the curse of no one will hire me. And look, I'm doing this one and this one. Oh, I'm not going back. Oh, you know, I won't go back to Los County. I've got more things to do, more important things to do. And, and I just thought, oh, I'm gonna be a New Yorker. Well, it, for 15 years I tried. So then I come back to the 50th anniversary. Good grief, I was blown away. Somehow, it was the right time, the right place, I was at the right moment and I thought, I had, I had one of those light bulbs, those big light bulbs that go off, those Edison light bulbs. And I realized that I had learned every single thing I knew down here. And I thought, well, I, I just have to work there again. The Phoenix quotient, <laughs> out of the flames, uh, the Phoenix burb morphed into historical accuracy. That was the Phoenix, because we had a chance for the very first time since 1937 to reimagine all at the same time the entire picture. I watched him as he was doing uh, off and on the new Indian costumes. He went to the only source we have, Governor John White, who was in the 1584 expedition and the 85 and the 87 expedition to Roanoke Island, had drawn the native Indians, kings, maidens, and so forth, and William Ivey took those sketches of John White and interpreted them so that they could be used for years. We never have a costume that is made for one year. Ten years at least they've got to be worn. And that was a real, uh, a real change in the colony when he did that. I am optimistic that the Lost Colony will survive. There is a story being told here, and it goes to the root. Hokey, uh, corny, uh, grassroots, all those seemingly negative terms, guess what? That's what hits the heart. Franklin Roosevelt came to the opening, or came to Virginia Day's birthday for a reason. He showed up and said, this is important story to tell. We're still doing it. It, uh, it engages one's connection across the decades and the centuries to man striving to, you know, be the best he can be. Dreams come true, dreams fail, but you still stick with it. I mean, these are great, great themes, and we're still doing it. Now more than ever, we need to believe we can conquer this. It's a wonderful story. It's a true story, and it's our story.